Welcome to a Not Avenue Christian Church video production. Not Avenue Christian Church is a non-denominational, multi-ethnic church located at 315 South Not Avenue, a quarter mile south of Lincoln in Anaheim, California. We hope you will be blessed and encouraged by today's message. All right, well, welcome to Not Avenue Christian Church. My name is Pastor Paul. I'm very excited that you're here tonight. Very excited for us to continue to go on through our series that we're calling Heritage. Heritage, the tagline underneath that is the way it's always been. The way it's always been, what we're looking at through this series, through this four-week series, is what were the characteristics, descriptions of the first century church? And how can we kind of jump into that heritage, jump into that timeline, and say we follow the same characteristics, the same description. We could say we are just like them. Now, of course, there are certain things that are different, right? In the 21st century, we have certain technologies. They didn't have a TV on stage when they taught in first century synagogues, right? There are certain things that are different, but there are certain things we want to make sure that we have in line together. That we saw as impactful as they were in a time of persecution, we could be impactful in the 21st century, not a time in America of persecution, but at least to some degree of opposition and in other places of persecution. So what we're trying to do as we unpack these different characteristics, and we've kind of singled out four of them. The first one was boldness. The one we did last week was generosity. This week is unity, and the next one will be sacrifice. As we go through that, we really want God to show us. God, show, show us as KCC members, how do you want us to be described? Because in our time of transition right now, where we're looking forward, looking in the future for that future leader who's going to lead us, who's going to be our lead pastor, we want God to show that to us. And I hope you continue in your private time of prayer, and even now, in the, during songs or any time of congregational prayer, that you're praying that God would make that very clear to us. But we also, at the same time, on the same track, don't want to leave our minds too far in future things, but to say, God, what do you want me to be right now as a member of this church. So that's why we're doing this. Now as we walk through unity, unity is important in any group. If you're in the business world, you know that your corporate success is based off of teamwork. If your independent parts don't form some sense of synergy, then your team is not going to do well. Your corporation is not going to do well. You're not going to have a great profit margin if all your different silos are working in a different direction. All your different departments are competing against each other or pulling the company away from its vision. We know that even in, in family life, unity is important. Surveys have gone out and shown and, and research has been done to say one of the most uh, greatest contributions to a child's emotional health is our mom and dad unified. Do they love each other? We see this. It, it, broken homes are the ones where we find kids kind of working in an uphill battle to be emotionally healthy. Unity is important in the home. It's important in business. And it's important in church. Now, when we jump into the New Testament, when we jump into the book of Acts, this struggle for unity was real. I mean, there was tension. There was conflict. It was hard. They had to have a large meeting to nail some of these issues down. But once they became unified, their impact increased exponentially. And so we have to ask ourselves that same question. As a 21st century church, how can we be unified? What's the roots of and the foundation of our unity, of course, everybody here has some sense of diversity. It could be your culture, your upbringing, your social, economic status, whatever it is. We all have a sense of diversity. But there has to be some unity, a foundational work in us that brings us all together as a church. So what is that? What's the makeup of that? Well, as we walk through the book of Acts, what we see is the primary character who brings unity to the church is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. Third person of the Trinity. We sang it in the song in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit. We believe that God is three persons. One God, three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when we look at his activity in the book of Acts, we see he is about the new unity of the church. Now in order to unify the church, he had to change things. In order to unify the church, he had to reprogram some thinking of those in the first century church, even those closest to Jesus. Let me show that to you. If you open your bulletins, you're going to find in there a piece of paper that has a lot of Bible verses on it. These are the verses that we are going to try to cover tonight. There might be another verse that's not on here, but it will be on the PowerPoint. But we're going to walk through this, and what I want to show you is this. 
Two things and two giant examples and descriptions of unity that the Holy Spirit showed the first century church. Now, again, I said he had to change some of the thinking. and had to change some of the programming, some of the outlook of even the closest followers of Jesus Christ. The person I'm thinking of specifically is a guy named John. John, he's not only one of the twelve, he was one of the three. The closest inner circle near Jesus Christ. The one who got more teaching than anybody else. This guy's paradigm have to be shifted in order for unity to be in the first century church. Let me show you this. If you look in that first passage there, this is Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 51. And this is John. This is John's mindset before he has a couple conversations and sees a demonstration of the Holy Spirit that would change his whole understanding on the idea of unity. So let's pick up with verse 51. This is Luke chapter 9. It says, When the days drew near for him, him being Jesus at this point in our story, for him to be taken up, he set his face to Jerusalem. Now right now, Jesus is in the northern region of Israel. He's in a place near Galilee, and the region below Galilee is Samaria. And in order to get to the city he wants to get to, he has to travel through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. South of Jerusalem is Judea. So he's got to go through Samaria. That's what he's doing right now. And as he's going through there, he knows the tree's seen a ton of those Travelocity commercials. He knows he needs to book a hotel in advance. So that's what he does. He sends his guys out. Let's go book a deal. Give me a good deal. So this is what he does. He, they go on Travelocity.com. They type in their password. They do all that stuff, and this is what happened. Verse 52. He sent his messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of Samaria to make preparations. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. He tries to book a hotel, and they go in there and say, so is this a personal visit? Is this a business visit? And they say, well, we're headed towards Jerusalem. Oh, we have no rooms available. Sorry. Can't help you. They're rude. That's kind of mean. So they leave, and maybe they try another spot, and it doesn't work again. Now, the reaction is one that is extremely dynamic. Now, it is very frustrating if you're going on a trip or a vacation. When you go online, you're trying to find that great deal, and you just keep getting, you, you, you keep getting bumped off, and you're about to put your credit card information, but the time elapses, and then somebody else steals your room. It's frustrating, right? Makes you sometimes want to throw the mouse on the ground or slam your keyboard. But look at the reaction of this guy named John with his brother James. That's what it says in verse 53. It says, The people did not receive him because he was, his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they're, again, they're frustrated. Tried to book the hotel, didn't work out. They said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's a little much. Right? I know none of you in this room have ever gotten that angry to stare at your computer screen and like, I want to burn down every hotel in Lake Tahoe. Does that happen to you when you're trying to book your visit, right? Book your vacation, book an anniversary? The question is, why are these guys so angry? Just one hotel said, sorry, no room. Why so mad? Why are they so furious? Because there's a history between the Jews and the Samaritans. And if you don't know the history, when you see this reaction, you think this is totally out of place. What is going on here? See, the Jews and the Samaritans, they really did not like each other. They had bad blood. More serious than any Taylor Swift breakup. They had really, really bad blood. Okay, what happened is in uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, around the year about 722 B.C., before Jesus Christ was ever born, the people of God were one nation at one time. But they got split up. They broke up. So you had the northern kingdom, you had the southern kingdom. And what happened is the, southern, the northern kingdom sinned. They disobeyed God. They didn't want to follow his rules or his direction. They had a lot of bad kings. So God decides to punish them. He sends a foreign army in and they take all the people from the north. And then the king decides, well, we got to put somebody there. Somebody's got to be in those northern places. So he takes a bunch of foreigners and he puts them in the northern land. Turns out there's still a small remnant of Jews in that northern land. So they start to intermingle, intermix. And the king says, I want you to worship the God of that region, the God of that land. So they start to take on some of the biblical practices you would find in the Old Testament. But they're, to say the least, they're half-breeds. They're mutts in some sense. Not only genetically, but theologically. Because they come in, they're foreign people, they come in with their set of beliefs. They come in with their practices. And as they intermingle with these Jews, a small amount of Jews that are left, everything starts to change. 
They look at the Old Testament and they rip out some books they don't like. They say, we're only going to follow five of these books. Then even in five of those books, they start to rename things. And they say the real temple of God does not belong in Jerusalem, but Mount Gerizim. So they change the theology. They intermix and intermingle and kind of dilute the genetic pool. So anytime a Jew, say living in Judea or Galilee, would look at a Samaritan, this is what he thought of. He thought of the great northern nation and its sin. He thought of the division, the civil war of God's people, the enslavement, the repopulation, the half-breed theology, right? The syncretism. So every time a Samaritan was looked at, all of that history was brought up inside of him. And it brought in a lot of conflict. There's at one time in the history of the Jews where they were fighting their enemies and they thought the Samaritans would help them, but they didn't. They abandoned them. So the Jews were upset about this. About 100 years before Jesus was ever born, the Jews were so furious with the Samaritans, they went in and destroyed their temple. After Jesus was resurrected and the church was growing, we know that at one point when some Jews were traveling through Samaria, that the Samaritans massacred this group of Jews. So these guys do not like each other at all. So when James and John respond like this, what are they responding to? Enemies. These are enemies. These these are not God's people. They don't believe the same thing we believe. They say they're Jews, but they're not Jews. They're just mutts. They're dirty dogs. It was an insult to call somebody a Samaritan. So that's why they have this bad blood in them. So when John sees a Samaritan, he sees an enemy. He says, keep these people out. Now the crazy thing, I said, the Holy Spirit's going to have to change things, right? He's going to have to shift the paradigm. If he's going to bring unity to the New Testament church, he's going to have to change things. And he does this for John in a very peculiar way. Let's look at our next passage. So John sees these Samaritans, doesn't like him, wants to call down fire. Several years pass, Jesus Christ teaches more, he dies on the cross, raises from the grave, teaches his disciples again, he leaves. The church starts to grow, and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for the sins of humanity, right, his sacrifice, that news goes to the Samaritan villages. And look what happens. This is in Acts chapter 8, our next passage there. This is starting with verse 12. But when they believe, these are the Samaritans, When they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued to follow Philip. And seeing signs and great wonders performed, he was amazed. So they believed. They were baptized. Everything looks good. Everything is genuine. This is awesome. Now you got to think, with social media the way it was then and the speed of news, no, it wasn't there, but news traveled. It got to the brothers in Jerusalem. It got to the Jews who hated the Samaritans. And when it gets to kind of the Jerusalem church, this is their response. we got to investigate this. We know those guys. They're just mutts. They're the enemy. The only thing that they're there for is target practice when you call down fire from heaven. That's all they're there for. Objects of God's wrath. This is what the church does. Verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. Greatest guy to write to send. I mean, John is like number one fan of the Samaritans, right? No, he doesn't like these guys. He wanted them to see, he wanted them to be just kindling for God's wrath only a couple chapters ago in the book of Luke. So they send John, and look at John's experience with the Samaritans. How everything changed for John. How when John looked at him before, he saw only enemies, people to keep out. But now he sees something else. This is what it says in verse 15. It says, So they who came down and they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now this is really strange. This is one of the hardest passages in the book of Luke to understand. See, because what, what we have here is a delay. We have a delay. Normally how it happened is people would believe and the Holy Spirit at that moment would come upon them and fill them. That's what we see. It's a pattern in the New Testament. It's a pattern in the book of Acts. 
It's a pattern later when Paul writes to his churches. In the New Testament, you believe and the Spirit is in you automatically. Nobody needs to be an intermediary for that to happen. Nobody needs to lay hands on you for the Spirit to come in you. It's faith and then he comes in. So the question is, why the break in the pattern? And this verse, there are articles, dissertation, commentaries written all about this verse. It's one of the most debated verses in the book of Acts. Because it's a delay, it's a difference, it's a pattern change, it's an anomaly. Well now think about your personal life. Your patterns that you do, maybe your daily routine. Like I live a mile and a half away from church and so I drive the same exact route every time to get here. I'm boring like that, I just do that. Now if I were to take an alternate route, that maybe instead of being one and a half miles away, was three miles in distance. And I came, and you notice I was in the parking lot a little later, and you say, well, what happened? Oh, I had to deviate from my plan because there was construction. Right? I had to change the pattern, change the order, change my habit because something was in the way. There's a point. There's an intention when you break a pattern. So the question is, what's God's point? Right? Why is he breaking his pattern? I think he wants to teach us something. He wants to teach something to the Jews. He wants to teach something to the Samaritans. And I think he wants to teach something to John. Why else would Luke mention him? When Luke writes his gospel, he mentions John and his hatred for the Samaritans. And then when he writes the unfolding of the New Testament church, he does not fail to mention John being with the Samaritans. I think God wants to show John a lesson. The guy who saw an outsider as an enemy needs to look at them differently. So let's look what happens. They lay hands on them. They pray for them. Verse 17. And when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And then verse 25 says, And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So what does John see? He prays over these people. He sees people who are now receiving Jesus before him, the story before. They rejected Jesus. He wanted fire to come down. Now they're accepting Jesus, and he's the one that God has chosen. For some reason, breaking the pattern, breaking the order, breaking his habit, he says, John, go lay hands on him and watch what I do. And you could just almost imagine John standing there as a Jew, knowing the history, knowing the conflict, knowing what he grew up with, the hatred that he had for these people. He puts his hand on a Samaritan, and he sees the Holy Spirit fall on him, and then fall on all of them. And he thinks back, in Acts chapter 2, this had just happened to him. He was praying, and the Holy Spirit came upon him and his brothers that were waiting there for the Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. It fell on him. And now these foreigners, these outsiders, get the same thing that he got. But is John mad about this? No, he's happy. He's joyous. He loves this. He says he rejoices and he keeps going. He says, I kind of like Samaria now. I'm just going to go around and do a tour of Samaria. Well, why the change? What happened? What happened from the John over here who wanted to call down fire and the John over here who wants the Holy Spirit to fall on everybody? What happened? What changed him? Well, Jesus Christ changed him. One conversation with Jesus Christ changed him. Flip your page and go over to Acts chapter 1. This is the conversation that changed John. Conversation with Jesus. We're actually going to start in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. Because this question sometimes is treated totally wrongly. And so I want to start with this question in verse 6. And so it says, So when they had come together, this is all of Jesus' followers. Again, these are just the closest ones at this point right now. Jesus is about to leave. He's about to go to heaven. He's been with them for 40 days. He's appeared to many people. He's taught them. He's about to leave. And they ask him a question. And this is what they ask. It says this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, every time I've read that verse, every time, before this week and before I did a little study about this verse. I always took this idea of the kingdom. I always took this idea of, God, when are you going to give us power? I always took it as a political thing, as a power trip. That's how I interpreted it. I thought, this is John again. This is John coming in and saying, hey, 
Jesus, when are we going to rain down fire on all of our enemies? When are we going to get them? Those Romans, I'm tired of Caesar. I want to rule. I want to reign. When are you going to give us authority and power? When can we pick up a sword and say, let's destroy all of God's enemies? I always read that verse that way, but I think that's a wrong way to read that verse. And here's why. Jump back to verse 3. We have to realize this question comes from the context of a conversation. It's a conversation that Jesus is having with his followers right after his resurrection. This is the conversation he has. Verse 3 says this. He presented himself alive to them, and after his suffering, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. They get Jesus for 40 days. And all he's doing is teaching them this is the kingdom. This is how God's family works. This is the kingdom. 40 days they get this teaching. 40 days. And then Jesus tells them about a promise that is coming. It says in verse 4, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. He said, Stay here, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John, or so, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what does this question come out of? Jesus is teaching. And Jesus has not taught his followers, hey, pick up a sword, let's take the Romans out. Jesus has not shown himself to be a military leader. What did he do? He allowed himself to be crucified. He allowed himself to be captured. To say that they're only thinking in a military, political way would be totally to ignore everything that's happened in the gospel so far. So what they're asking, I don't think, is, God, when can we call down fire on our enemies. I don't think they're asking that. But look at Jesus' response to their question. This is verse 7. This is what changes John. As he, he said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the season the Father has fixed by his own authority. How does Jesus respond? They ask him a when question, and Jesus says timing is not the difference. Timing does not matter. It's not a when issue. It's a how issue. They're asking, when will Israel come back? When will Israel be okay? When will our people be united? They're not asking, when will we overthrow the Romans? They're just saying, God, when will your promise come true? You said you'd bring us back from exile. You said you'd bring your people back. You said you'd bring the family back. And Jesus answers how he will do that. He doesn't say when he will do that. This is what he says to them in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea and Samaria. What is he saying right there? Again, if you know the map, the map looks like this. Samaria is the northern region. Judea is the southern region. Jerusalem is right there in the middle. What Jesus is saying, I'm bringing the family back. North, south, they used to be divided. No longer. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, I'm bringing everybody back. I'm getting the family back together. We're getting the band back together. But not just them. And this is what changes John. This is what makes him look at Samaria and not see enemies anymore. This is what makes him change his understanding. Look what it says in the last part there. It says, but you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying everybody, everybody is family. Everybody. No matter your crimes, no matter your past, no matter your gender, no matter your culture, everybody is family. Judea, Samaria, the hated ones, even everybody else, all of the Gentiles, everybody across the globe, everybody is now welcome into this family. And when Jesus says this, it shakes the first century paradigms. You see, because over here, they took the Old Testament and they turned it around. I mean, one of the biggest failures of God's people in the Old Testament is this. They had this mentality, and this is what God wanted. God wanted a come-in mentality. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, he describes the people being obedient. He describes them doing everything that God wants them to do. To handle their scales to correctly. To dress correctly. To eat correctly. I mean, everything. He's building a culture and he wants other cultures to see this culture and say, wow, this works. And what the Jews were supposed to do, is says, yeah, man, come in. Come in. Be a part of this. The nations were always a part of the plan. But the mission strategy was come in. 
You see, what happened, though, is the things that used to make them distinct, the walls that were up that used to define their identity became walls that deterred people. So instead of the strategy of come in, what happened is they said, you guys need to keep out. Keep out. Their insulation became isolation. And so instead of seeing people as future family members, seeing people and saying, you can come in here. Come be a part of our culture, our community. You're going to have to change some things. This is true in the Old Testament. You're going to have to wear four tassels on your cloak. You can't have a garment that's, that's interwoven with two materials. You can't eat certain things. But this is our culture. You take on this culture, and God is going to bless you. You're going to be a part of the community of God. Come in. But see, come in became keep out. And God did not want that. And that was Israel's sin, the people of God's sin. And we saw that in John when he visited Samaria. He didn't have a come in mentality. He didn't have, hey, Samaria, come back to us. Come back to the God that you say you serve. No, rather, what did he say? Keep out. Stay over there. I don't want fire to hit me, so you go over there. Be at arm's length when fire comes down. But Jesus changes both those paradigms. The wrong thinking of keep out, the old thinking of come in. He says, now... It's go out. It's go out. Go to every single culture, every single one, and tell them this one message. Have faith in me and your family. Have faith in me and your family. You don't have to become a Jew. It doesn't matter that you wear four tassels on your cloak or what you eat, your dietary restrictions. Culture doesn't matter anymore. So he breaks down the barriers of culture and he says, faith, faith equals family. And we know that. Look at us. Just look around you. You see a diversity. You can tell by just the the skin pigmentation that faith has made us family. Faith has unified us. And so now when we see people, we don't see them as enemies. Oh, keep them out. Keep them safe from this community. When we look out, what do we see? Future family members. People should be in the family of God. The Holy Spirit showed the New Testament the church this in a dramatic way, in a dramatic fashion. And the Holy Spirit fell on everybody. Every culture received it. And not because they came in and became Jewish. No, because the Jews came out and went out and shared the message of faith alone in Jesus Christ. And it changed everything. And it unified the church in its diversity. They saw unity because faith is what bound them together. But he taught them another lesson. Because something very strange about the Holy Spirit falling on everybody is why the Holy Spirit fell on everybody. What was the result of this falling? Now we got to go back, and these are your last passages here in Numbers. When the Holy Spirit falls on everybody, he not only tells them everybody is family, and now shows us that everyone is off the bench. The New Testament church was unified in its message, everybody's family in faith. They're also unified in their mission, everyone is off the bench. The bench. Let me show you this. This is in Numbers chapter 11. What's happening is this guy Moses is leading so many people. He has taken them out of Egypt. They haven't even become a nation yet. This is kind of their birth, their inception, the moment they became God's people. He leads them out of Egypt, but there's so many of them, and he's the only leader, and the Spirit of God is only resting upon him. So he's the only one with wisdom that can lead these people, but there's so many, and they're so hungry. And if you've taken a road trip with two children, he's probably got a million. And just with two, you've got to stop all the time. You've got to have potty breaks. They're hungry. All that stuff. Well, that's what he's dealing with. He's trying to lead these people, and there's millions of them. They're saying, we don't have meat. We're so hungry. Feed us. I need beef jerky. He's on my side. Right? All those things that happen in a road trip. Daddy, he touched me. He's poking me. He's dealing with all of this. And he gets to the point and says, God, I cannot handle this. He just kind of breaks and he says, God, why did you leave me out here? This is going to kill me. And God says, okay, this is what we're going to do. I want you to pick 70 people. Pick 70. I'm going to put my spirit on them just like my spirit's on you. Moses is like, all right, this sounds like a great idea. So he picks 70 people. He says, bring them close to the tent of meeting and I'm going to pour out my spirit on them. Well, just like any church function, right, you try to get everybody together, what happens? Not everybody shows up. Just because you say you're going to be there on Facebook doesn't mean you show up. So only 68 people make it to the tent of meeting. God's spirit falls on Moses. It falls on 68. Even the two guys who didn't go to church, they're just in the camp way over here. Holy Spirit falls on them too. God doesn't, he doesn't mind, right? They're going to get, they're going to watch the sermon online anyway, so they're covered. 
So he, he blesses them too. Well, there's a guy in the camp, and he's just sitting there, and he sees these two men, and they're starting to act like Moses. They're starting to prophesy. And the Spirit is on him, and he goes, wait a second, this isn't right. Our leader is Moses. He's the one with the Spirit. So he runs up to Joshua, the second in command with Moses, and he goes, Joshua, there's these guys in the camp, and they're trying to act like Moses. So Joshua goes up to Moses, and he says, this is what he says in this verse right here. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord, stop them. What is he saying? You're the leader. You're the boss. We follow you, Holy Spirit. He's on you. All these guys are trying to mimic you. They're trying to take your role, take your job. And look what Moses says. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Are you worried about my job? They're not going to vote me off this island. Would all that the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. What does Moses wish? Man, I wish everybody had the spirit. It's hard. Basically, he's saying it's hard being in the starter. Right? I got to lace up every night, get on the court. All the stands are filled. The bench players are all there, but I'm the starter. I got to make all the shots. I got to make all the calls. And what he's saying is I would love for everybody to be on this court. This is a hard job. Leading these people is a hard job. But that's just a wish of Moses. Then it becomes a promise. A prophet by the name of Joel promises a day that would come. This is in your next passage in Joel chapter 2. It says, It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now this is radical. Because God's spirit has only fallen on people like Moses. Leaders, prophets, priests, kings. Not everybody. Not everybody gets it. Not everybody can be in the court at the same time. Somebody's got to be in the bleachers. Somebody's got to be in the stands. Somebody's got to sit the bench. Somebody's got to get the guy's water. But that's not what Joel has in mind. He says this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, so now even the kids are getting it, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And this is even more radical in verse 29. Even the male and female servants, the slaves, get it. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. And this is what happens. Is in the New Testament, this is what happens. Just like Moses wished, just like Joel promised, the Holy Spirit falls on everybody. Everybody who believes gets it. In Acts chapter 2, we see Jews coming from everywhere. They all believe, they all get it. It's more remar remarkable. It's amazing. Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, the hated ones, the one that John wished fire would come down and destroy him, they believe, they get it. Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, the Gentiles, the complete outsiders of God's rules, God's law. They believe what happens. They get it. And this transforms the New Testament church. Because what does it mean? There is no bench. There are no bleachers. Everybody is on the court. Everybody is playing. Everybody has the same spirit that the great leader Moses had in him. Everybody has it. And it changes the dynamic of the church because it means its growth is not dependent on few. Let me show this to you. This is in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. This kind of describes what this does when the Holy Spirit falls on everybody. How does this change the dynamic of the church? Acts chapter 8 says this. And there arose a day of great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So now we have two groups, the scattered ones and the apostles. It says everybody scattered except for the apostles. So we have all the scattered ones. Those are the amateurs. Those are the bench players. Those are the people in the bleachers rooting on with pom-poms. The apostles, the professionals, the one that acts, or sorry, Ephesians 2 says, God laid the foundation of the church through the apostles and Christ being the cornerstone. These are the professionals. They stayed in Jerusalem. All the scattered ones were not the professionals. But look what happens. Look what happens. Look at how the church grows. Verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen who had just died, the first martyr of the Christian church, and made a great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4, this is the important one. Now those who were scattered, which means what? The amateurs, not the professionals, not the apostles, the scattered ones. 
Not the ones that were closest to Jesus Christ. Not the ones who would pin the New Testament. Not those guys. Not the professionals. Not the starters on the court. Not the first line of defense. It was all the other guys. The bench players. Those guys. What did they do? It says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. It made the gospel go so incredibly fast that when Paul would write his letter to Rome, he would say, I'm surprised that faith has even reached you because I haven't got to you yet. An apostle hasn't got to you yet, but somehow there are believers there. How? Because the church preached the gospel. Acts chapter 1 says when we receive the Holy Spirit, what happens? We become his witnesses. Where? To the whole world. There's nobody on the bench. Why was the New Testament church so dynamic? Why were they so impactful? Two things the Holy Spirit showed them. One, everybody's family. Second is everyone is off the bench. Everyone is family. Nobody in the New Testament church ever looked at somebody and said, no, you're an outsider. You don't belong. Keep out. That's not how the church grew. They would see another culture and say, yeah, let's embrace that. Oh, you eat weird food. That's cool. I'm down with that. You have strange dress. That's cool. Your music is different. Have faith, my friend, and let the gospel seep into your cultural expression, and it will be beautiful to God. You don't have to become like me, act like me, dress like me, eat like me. Just have faith. And we're brothers, and we're family. And that made the church grow because you didn't have to change your culture to become a Christian. So everybody is family. And then when you got in the family, you know what happened? You started doing the family business. You were off the bench. No one ever, think about this, no one ever saw themselves as disqualified. No one ever had anxiety, God can't use me. My past, my crimes, my hang-ups, my hurts, my disabilities, my divorce, God can't use me. I'm on the shelf. Nobody's on the shelf. There is no bench. There are no stands. There are no bleachers. Christianity is not a sport for spectators, but for participants. Everybody is out on the field. I remember when I first got that, that last part. I was hanging out with this executive pastor. His name was Rich. He's a genius. I always call him a Jedi master because he would always come in and he would kind of speak like Yoda at times, like in these small ways, and you had to think about it, and you're like, wow, that's really profound. So Rich comes into a staff meeting once, and he has all these young guys. And so I'm one of the young guys coming in, and I just graduated with a master's degree. My buddy had, had finished his master's degree. There are two guys who had their bachelor's degree, and so we were kind of the young guys on the staff. And so the older guys wanted to come in and say, hey, um, we want to teach you young guys how to do this, you know, show you the ropes, which was awesome. I loved it. Let's glean from your wisdom. So we sat in this room, and we're sitting there, and Rich comes in, and he says, guys, this is what we're going to talk about today. I was like, oh, cool. You know, I'm geeking out. I'm like a, a pencil and a piece of paper. Like, go for it. What are you going to teach me? And again, Rich was kind of that Yoda-type character. So this is what he says. He says, I'm going to ask you guys a question. I was like, okay. I kind of wanted to hear from you, but okay, ask the question. He says, what's the difference between a large church and a small church? Now, I was like Peter. You know, I just always talked and just shot my hand up and spoke. Never thought about what I was saying usually, right? So he would say, what's the difference between a large church and a small church? Well, easy. I was like, yeah, one's big, one's small. Done. Next question. I got this. And he goes, no. Okay, uh, one has a large budget, one has a small. No. Okay. Um, one has more. No. Oh, rich. This, and I, I keep going, and I keep going. And I'm, I'm persistent. I'm stubborn. I'm strong-willed, right? I see it in my kids. That's how I know it's true. And, and I keep going. And he says, no, it, let me give you a hint. It has nothing to do with quantity. And I go, that's so unfair. You just said the difference between large and small. You put a quantity on it. So isn't difference quantifiable? And he says, no. So we try to shoot on answers. They're all garbage. Right? So he kind of just speaks into the fog of our ignorance and everything parts. And this is what he says. This is like the last thing he says, and he just kind of drops the mic and leaves the room. And it blew my mind. This is what he says. He says, you know what the difference between a large church and a small church is? I said, okay, Rich, tell us. He says, in a small church, the pastor does the ministry. In a large church, the people do the ministry. And then he left. And that blew my mind. And I thought, man, I had been building a student ministry 
I have been building what I have been building based off of my personality, based off of my giftings, based off of me being the only person doing the work. And I had underutilized so many Holy Spirit-filled, gifted people. And my job was to equip them, is to help them, to unleash them. And at that moment, that was kind of the watershed moment that changed our student ministry up north. That was the moment where we started unleashing students, where students got on mission, where adults got on mission, where they owned the ministry. And I could leave, and it would run, and it would work, and it was awesome, and people were moving. And I thought to myself, I have always considered myself, maybe I wouldn't say it or verbalize it, but in my heart and how I ran the ministry was, I'm the only qualified one that the professional get on court. It's Kobe time. And that was not it. I was putting people on the bench that didn't belong there. So here's my question to you. Can we, at Not I'm a Christian Church, learn these two lessons? That everybody is family and everybody's off the bench. Everybody is family, meaning what? An outsider is not an enemy. An, enemy. an outsider is just a future family member. Somebody who we want to bring in. So we're going to go out and we're going to tell them about the faith of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to tell them, hey, you're going to have to talk like me, act like me, dress like me, eat like me, be like me, come into a building that looks exactly like what I want and the station that I play and the music that I like. But we go and we just say, have faith. And you're part of this family. You know how you could test your heart with that? If you really want to see, do I have the heart of John that's welcoming, the heart that says, okay, everybody is family. I don't see you as an enemy. Just read through recent Facebook posts of yours and see how you've responded to cultural issues. And just try to feel out the perception of your response and to see, am I treating these people as enemy combatants? Am I treating them as the enemy to be defeated or an argument to be won and not a family member or an orphan to be adopted? Right? That's the paradigm. We want to bring lost sons back. Right? We just don't want to checkmate their arguments. We just don't want to win them over as enemies or to push their lines back. No, we want to bring them in as sons. Do you see everybody as family or future family members? Or on, this, on the other side, the other lesson, everyone is off the bench. Where is your hesitation lying? In serving, in getting involved. Oftentimes where our hesitation lies is in our esteem. We feel like we're not good enough. We feel like we can't do it. We're not equipped enough. We don't have the abilities enough. God can't use us. The qualifications for your ministry are, do you have the Holy Spirit? That's it. Not what you bring in, but what he has brought into you. There should be no hesitation. There's no bench. There's no bleachers. We're all on the court. We're all working. We're all trying to make an impact. This is what changed the first century. This can, what, this can change the 21st century. This is the way the church has always been. The question is, is that the way it'll be here? Let's pray. And Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel message. We thank you that you do call us home, that you do bring us back, that you treat us all now as family, that you don't see us as the enemy estranged from you. You don't see us as enemy combatants. You don't fire missiles at us, but what you do is you die for us. Is you take the hit for us. You sacrificed yourself so we could be family. God, I pray that we would not lose that, that we are all family, that it is not our cultures that define us. It's not the glue that keeps us together. It is faith that keeps us together. Faith in a risen Lord, the one who defeated death on our behalf. And God, now that we're all family, we can all be a part of the family business. The Holy Spirit, it resides inside of us, empowers us, moves us, is a catalyst to great work in us. God, I pray that we would not diminish the work that we think we can do because we only look at ourselves and our usefulness. But we could say, I have the spirit of the everlasting God residing in me, qualifying me for ministry. What can I do? Not should I do this, but what opportunity can I do? What should I get out there 
and try to serve in? In what way? God, I pray that you'd give us confidence in your spirit and you making us adequate. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This has been a Not Avenue Christian Church video production. If you'd like information about Not Avenue Christian Church, or after giving to your home church, you feel led to contribute to Not Avenue Christian Church, please visit our website at www.kacc.com. We thank you for watching and hope you'll join us again.